Imperial College London. Her main clinical and educational interests are peritoneal dialysis, dialysis in elderly, and renal supportive care. She is the principal investigator for FIPOR. She has published extensively on peritoneal dialysis and dialysis in elderly and is the author, auditor for several books. She is Dr. Professor Brown. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks once again to PSN for inviting me to come here and talk. I've really enjoyed my time and participation in this conference. And I find the enthusiasm for getting peritoneal dialysis restarted in this country um, really rewarding. It. And I wish you the best of luck. And we are here, um, you know, the experts elsewhere and the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis um, to help you in, in that venture. So we're going to be talking about the, the various definitions of different types of infection, um, management, and prevention. So this is a very old slide that I think I um, stole from Ram Doka, who was one of the doyens of peritoneal dialysis, worked in Manchester um, in the UK, um, and really shows the various parts of PD, but the process of PD, where infection can be, um, can be introduced. And many of these we can do something about. We can certainly, um, you know, with, with modern connections um, that exist, it's not just the process of producing the fluid, it's also having the connectors and the lines, etc. We certainly don't want, number one, um, the infection from the exchange procedure, um, and, and we no longer put spikes into bags. Um, so, so that's one thing that has been obliterated um, in, in the last 20 years. You then need to think about the sort of Connector number two there, where they can connect the bag to, to the catheter um, and, and the catheter, um, so the mini set line that lines between the bag tubing and the catheter. And again, your procedures for changing that tubing need to be very robust. And again, all of this is in, in the guidelines. Uh, patients need to be trained um, how not to get infection around their exit site. But there is very little that we can do about transcolonic um, spread of hematopotomies. So there's always going to be some things that are causing infection that are very hard to produce. So infection is going to happen in people on peritoneal dialysis. But remember, infections also occur in people on hemodialysis, particularly if they've got networks. So the definition of peritonitis is having two of these three um, components, abdominal pain or tenderness, cloudy fluid with greater than 100 white cells um, per mil, with over 50% of those being neutrophils, um, and identification of the organism. And since identification of the organism is going to take some time, in clinical practice, it's numbers one and two. And, and as I explained in the workshop on Friday, you do not need to wait until you get the microscopy back to start antibiotics. If somebody has got really cloudy fluid, just get on and give the antibiotics. So this is, um, the, the key part of all of this is getting the patient to recognize the cloudy band. And part of the training process is um, the teaching of that and telling them what to do when they get the cloudy bag. So we train our patients to put a bit of newspaper underneath the bag when they're draining, uh, and if, if they can read the printed page, then in, through, through the bag, then that fluid is clear. If they can't, it's cloudy. So peritonitis is a major cause of morbidity, and it has an impact on quality of life. It interrupts the usual routine for the patient, who now has to frequently come up to the hospital. It is associated with mortality, though this is very infrequent and certainly much lower than if you get infections related to central venous catheters. Um, it remains a major cause of technique failure. Um, it does contribute to changes in membrane permeability, and we need to remember that exit site infections can lead to catheter loss and peritonitis. 
So these are the audit standards for peritonitis um, from the ISPD, which is 0.5 episodes per year of risk, or one episode per 24 patient months. Um, the UK Renal Association is very similar, um, with a primary cure rate of greater than 80% and a culture negative rate of less than 20%. Having said that that is the audit standard, actually in many countries, as we heard from previous talks um, this morning, are, are much lower than that. And that includes countries um, which have a PD first policy, so they're putting on uh, patients who may not have started PD in other countries, um, and they're often very hot, um, humid countries, like countries um, like Pakistan. And then I don't have a slide to show it because it's not been published yet, but I hope it has been presented at meetings. Uh, the infection rates that have come through the PDOP study, um, which looks at um, six different countries, um, which are UK, US, Japan, Thailand, um, Australia, and Canada. And actually, the country with the highest infection rate, I regret to say, is the UK. Um, and Thailand has a very much lower infection rate um, than, than we do. So yes, you can get low rates of peritonitis in um, low resource countries with hot, humid weather. So this is the terminology that rather confuses the field of peritonitis, but it is important to know. So recurrent peritonitis is that which occurs uh, within four weeks, but with a different organism. Relapsing peritonitis is within four weeks with the same organism. And repeat peritonitis is when you get the same organism but more than four weeks away. The reason that's important is, is that you know, the recurrent, um, I mean, the relapsing and repeat peritonitis implies that you've got a biofilm um, and that you should be exchanging So it was recognised very early on, um, this is a paper that Simon Davis published um, 20 years ago, um, showing that peritonitis was a major cause of technique failure. It is still true today, this is the ANS data registry, so this is from Australia, showing that infection was causing 30% of technique failure, um, and a Canadian study um, which has shown that uh, the median time to technique failure um, has not really changed over many um, decades um, and there was no reduction in, in risk of technique failure due to peritonitis over those time periods. So peritonitis remains important wherever you do um, peritoneal dialysis and it was careful uh, attention to technique um, and careful protocols that can be brought down to very low levels. So in terms of catheter-related infections, the two most common are staphylococcal and pseudomonas uh, associated with biofilm and exit site problems. Um, then you have bowel source of um, organisms and, and we heard about how important these are in India. Um, it's causing 60% of peritonitis, and I suspect that may well be related to the high level of diarrhea um, associated with sort of poor drinking water. So, you know, addressing um, the diarrhea um, and, and waterborne infections uh, that that one gets in, in countries with poor hygiene is going to be really important to have a successful PD. It is important to mention culture negative peritonitis, and this occurs because of poor microbiology. It's not partly due to poor microbiology, and partly because there are other causes, um, such as recent antibiotic use, delays in getting the sample to the lab, endotoxins, etc. And if you have a culture negative peritonitis, it does not mean that you don't have an infection. You should still treat them as a bacterial infection. So in terms of management, you start with the clouded dialysate, the patient has to get to somewhere, and we went through different strategies in the workshop. Um, you need to then get a fluid sample by a nurse, um, who then sends it to the microbiology lab. Ideally, the fluid should go into a blood culture bottle, um, 
um, and that's the ISPD recommendation uh, to really um, increase your return of cultures. Empiric antibiotics must include um, vancomycin and heterosporin for a gram positive or and third generation heterosporin or amino glycoside for a gram negative. But what you use in your individual centers depends on your microbiology and this is again emphasizes the importance of developing microbiology links when you're setting up a PD program. So, you know, you can put antibiotics into the same bag, which means that you can send patients home with pre-injected bags. Uh, all the dosages are in the ISPD guideline. I cannot remember them off by heart. So, you know, when the, my nurses ring me up and say, what should we use? We do have them in our protocol um, that, that we use. Uh, but if it's anything out of the ordinary, then I always check the ISPD guideline, which I have in my phone. In terms of catheter removal, uh, uh, one needs to be able to recognize when an infection is not improving. Because the one thing you don't want to do is to leave that catheter in for too long, um, because you then just get a very sick patient. Um, so you do need to recognize when it's not getting better. Um, and the recommendation is within five days. Uh, you certainly need to remove the catheter if the peritonitis is associated with a tunnel infection, or if you have patients with chronic exit site infections, particularly those caused by um, staph aureus or pseudomonas. Um, if somebody has a fungal peritonitis, that catheter needs to be removed immediately. And I was asked in the workshops about using antifungal prophylaxis. That is an ISPD recommendation. The PDOPS data shows that most countries don't actually do this. We certainly don't do it in our center. But then I see about one patient with fungal peritonitis every two or three years. If the Indian experience is replicated in Pakistan, so you get 10% um, of your infections being fungal peritonitis, then you probably would need to use fungal prophylaxis. Um, and that is for every single time you use antibiotics, not just when you're giving antibiotics for peritonitis. And this is something you need to think about economically, they're, they're not cheap, the drugs, um, and you also need to always look at all the other medications uh, the patient is on um, and adjust the doses. So, uh, culture should be available by days three to four. Use the ISPD guidelines to check doses of antibiotics. Uh, the recommendation is to, you only need to give the antibiotics once a day. Uh, so you give a high dose and the bag dwells for six hours. So you get good systemic absorption. So the antibiotic then diffuses back into the bloodstream until you give um, another intraperitoneal dose the next day. Vancomycin only needs to be given once a week if no urine output and every five days if there is urine output. Um, you can measure levels, but that's going to be expensive. Um, and I think, if, you know, just the seven and five days is probably enough. Um, if they're culture negative, use vancomycin and ciprofloxacin. That's the ISBD recommendation. But I gather here in Pakistan, ciprofloxacin is rather handed out like sweeties. Um, so again, you need to discuss this with um, your microbiologists about what um, regime you're going to be using. So th this algorithm here comes from a very useful overview of peritonitis that has just been published in CJSON um, by Sheto from the Hong Kong group where they've got 70% of their patients on PD. Um, and, and, and this just is, is a very useful algorithm. And if you're interested in the topic, I suggest you read that paper. It's very useful. Refractory peritonitis we've really covered and I want to move on to really thinking about prevention. So in terms of prevention of peritonitis, um, the basic measures of patient education and training, I can't emphasize that enough. The ISPD has a guideline on how to train patients, but obviously you are going to need your, train your nurses first how to train the patients. Um, and, and that is an absolutely crucial part of, of, of the um, health process of avoiding infection. 
avoid constipation. Constipation is a big problem in PD, not just in terms of catheter function, but particularly with older patients, um, if, you, if they get constipated, they increase the risk of you know, activating their diverticular disease, and um, that again can predispose to gram negative infections. It's not just the PD nurses that you need to train. Um, as, as you've heard earlier from Dr. Um, Clark's um, talk, you know, their program has got one or two um, nurses, and that's all you will have in your units when they first start. But those nurses aren't always around. Patients may come in um, with their plaggy bag um, in off-duty hours, you know, middle of the night, some Sundays or, or whatever. So you do need to have other nurses trained in some of the PD techniques. So we have one ward area where we've trained our ward nurses and made sure that at least one nurse is on call every shift who knows how to get um, cultures from PD labs. So it's not any old nurse who comes and brings out the patient when they present with a cloudy panic. It should be somebody who knows how to do an exchange. And equally, if somebody is admitted and is too sick to do their own balance, if the people are sick and do a bad change when they're not feeling well, that's when they make mistakes and can get paranoitis. So you need to keep your ward nurses trained how to do um, PD. Your junior staff, your other nephrologists, also need to know something about peripheral dialysis. Hand washing between patients is really important. Um, it was striking in one unit that, you know, in units that I have visited in different countries, that sometimes people go straight from one patient to another, um, and there's no hand gel around. Hand gel is expensive, water and soap is not. Um, so hand washing in between patients is really important. Um, and, and also you need to de detect patient problems out in the community that can predispose, such as depression, um, which is very important. Um, burnout, which you've already mentioned. Um, if people get burnt out and bored with the procedure, they'll make mistakes. I very rarely have people on seven days a week PD. I tend to do it six days a week, so they get a day off particularly if the family's involved, um, because that also gives the family a day off. None of us want to work seven days a week, so why should families and patients have to do their PD seven days a week? So it's only if people are completely out of Europe and get fluid overloaded that I make them do seven days a week. And obviously having a clean area at home, which can just be a tray. You don't need a separate room, you don't need a separate table, but you do need a clean tray that you can do the exchanges on. So these are the potentially modifiable risk factors, um, most of these of which we've mentioned. I do need to emphasize connection methodology, that comes really from the first slide. If you're going to start making your own fluid um, for economic reasons, it's not just the fluid, it's also the connections. Uh, patients need retraining sometimes, so, you know, when, they, when they've had an episode of peritonitis, always go over um, how, how do they do their exchange? Um, in the first month, they're going to need much more monitoring um, about how they're doing things than they are later on. So what happens if people are getting recurrent or relapsing peritonitis? So, so this is um, a, quite a useful scheme. So if somebody gets um, a repeat episode of peritonitis um, within four weeks, if, if it's a relapse, um, in other words, it's the same organism. Um, so that's usually a staph aureus or a coagulase negative staph or pseudomonas. You need to consider um, catheter replacement. If it's a different organism, so that's a recurrence, you need to retrain the patient. If it's more than four weeks and it's a repeat episode of peritonitis, so again, the same organism, again, um, consider catheter um, replacement um, and uh, Afterward, you know, and if they get another infection of a different organism um, within six months, which is the sort of high risk period after your first episode of peritonitis, retrain them. So, in terms of catheter replacement, um, we do this at one sitting. Um, we will we usually we do this surgically um, in our own unit, 
but there are also units with interventional nephrologists, or who are more interventional than my colleagues, um, who take the catheter out and put a new one in percutaneously. Uh, so what we do is to make sure that they're covered with antibiotics, the same antibiotics as they were on for their um, infection, take the old catheter out and put the new one in. And that way you can avoid having to introduce a neckline into hemodialysis. So in terms of I'm going to skip through this. So in terms of prevention and treatment, training is really important. There is an ISPD guideline for that. Exit site care is also important using um, topical antibiotics, uh, cream or ointment, we tend to use mucuricin. Um, use cleaning agents when you're doing the um, exit site dressings. There's no evidence that any is better than another. Um, and, and have again have protocols for how you treat exit site infections. So this is just the data that shows um, things like mucuricin works. So this is really, you know, data has been around for a long time. So this was a randomized controlled trial. Um, showing that when mucuricin was introduced, um, the, the incidence of um, peritonitis, of staph aureus peritonitis, just disappeared. So this is an observational study, actually, after the randomized trials, um, and showed that in clinical practice, um, your staph aureus um, infections just disappeared. Um, and that's certainly the first question I always ask my patients. When did you, are you still using the person if they come in with staph aureus? And they have always stopped. There was a fear that this caused more gram negative infections, but that's actually only apparent because now you have more gram negative infections, but actually their rate, and the rate of pseudomonas infections are completely stable. So, in conclusion, infection in PD does result in significant morbidity, interruption to lifestyle, and permanent transfer to hemodialysis but it has a small mortality risk. <coughs> Infection management by PD units must include treatment protocols, um, which need to really be, I mean, there's no, absolutely no reason why every single unit starting PD re does this independently. This could easily be done by a group of nephrologists who are interested in PD nationally, and then this is shared um, with other PD units, so that it becomes like a Pakistan protocol for managing infection. Um, repeated education of non-PD nursing and medics um, is vitally important. Remember, your junior staff turn over, they rotate, nurses come and go. Um, so, so this is something that the PD team needs to take on to keep this training um, up to date. Good communication with your microbiology lab and training and retraining of patients regarding infection. So my final message is, first of all, you must know your peritonitis rate. We have a six-monthly audit when we look at how many infections we've had, what our rate is, um, and, and if it's gone up over the last six months, we, 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 you know, we, we do a, what's called a root cause analysis to try and work out why has this happened um, and what can we address. You need to know your local patterns of organisms to so using appropriate empirical antibiotics. You need to identify the local risks for peritonitis, and this is going to come out of your six-monthly audit, both unit-related and patient-related. And you need to identify a strategy to reduce these risks. And if you do all these things, PD, you can really drive down your infection rate and make PD a very acceptable modality.